We took a look at retouching, and we kind of decided that for the, you know, the best quality, best control, you want to be able to zoom in and take a look around the image. Take a look at everything and you know, kind of not leave things to chance. So for this one here, we talked about you know, what had been done on this image here. There had been some liquefying around the face, uh, a little bit of you know, lightning under the eyes. And we decided that probably the best way to do things was to take you know, just like a clone stamp, lower opacity, and let's say you wanted to soften under the eyes, grab a little bit of texture from here, and just kind of gently run it over. Subtle, but noticeable. If you need a little bit more of a, a kick, you can always hit it again, kind of bring that up. The important stuff, though, is always to keep skin texture. I see a lot of people where they'll soften things out to the point where you know, it starts to get this kind of waxy, sort of over-softened look to it. That might be a little bit overdone, so you always want to keep that texture in there. What do you guys know about the raw format? Does it involve cooking anything? Obviously not, it's raw. Um, what's the deal with raw? What can you do with raw that you can't do with JPEG? Get details back. Get details back? Like on this image up here, it looks like there's like a, a, it's a crime scene. There's like red stuff all over the floor there. What is that red stuff? It's an exposure warning. I've got my exposure warnings turned on. If I had shot JPEG, would I be able to get any of that highlight information back? No, it would be gone forever. Um, if I put my cursor over here, look at that, we've got in this part here, 255, 255, well, 254, uh, so there is some detail in the blue, but for the most part, the highlights are blown right out from that zero to 255 grayscale range. That whole patch of floor is white. Um, in JPEG, I'm screwed, but with RAW, I could pull the exposure down and get some of that detail back, or, I mean, you can see that whole history and kind of slides to the left there. Um, I could target just the highlights and pull those down and get some of that detail back. So you got a little bit of exposure leeway. Um, also, white balance. Let's say you were photographing at a, a wedding and doing the outdoor stuff, and you've got your white balance set to daylight, because you know, you're photographing in daylight. And then everybody heads into the banquet hall, so you go following after them. And now you're taking pictures inside under tungsten lights, but you forget to change the white balance on your camera. It's still set to daylight. You're photographing under tungsten. What sort of color cast are those images going to have? It's going to be very warm toned, isn't it? Tungsten has a very kind of a yellowish sort of look to it. And if you're shooting JPEG, you'd have to go into Photoshop. You'd have to go into, if it's got a yellow cast to it, which color channel would you go to? You have a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. Which color channel would you go to to fix a yellow cast? What's the opposite of yellow? It's blue. You'd go to your blue channel. You could add some blue. But that's going to damage the file, isn't it? Why would it damage the file if you were to play around with the color balance in Photoshop? Or if you were to play around with anything in Photoshop, the brightness, the contrast? Well, let's talk about bit depth for a second. What do you guys know about bit depth? If you're shooting in JPEG, what bit depth are you limited to? Eight. Eight bits per channel. We know that in a photograph, we've got three color channels. So if I were to look at this, we'll have, uh, well, what are the three channels that we'll have? What are the three color channels? Red, green, and blue. And if we zoom in here, in each of these color channels, it, it's basically a black and white photograph, but we have a, a limited number of shades of gray from the darkest black up to the brightest white. How many shades of gray are there from black to white? Remember that elastic string? Down here we have a zero. Zero is black. Going all the way up to what? What is white? We have 256 shades of gray all told. White, though, is 255 because they don't want black to be one. So instead of going one to 256, they make black zero, so it's zero to 255. But yes, it is 256 total shades of gray. What does that have to do with bits? Where does that 256 come from? Does that even make sense? It does if you break it down to how computers work. What's a bit? Anybody nerdy enough to admit they know what a bit is? It's a binary digit, the smallest thing that a computer can deal with. Um, and how do we represent bits when we're like writing them down? Zeros and ones, binary computer information, by meaning two, so zeros and ones. Um, we count in base 10, so we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, crap, we're out of characters. Okay, well, we'll put a one here and then a zero. So one zero for us means 10. Computers go one, crap, we're out of characters. So we'll put a one here and then a zero. So one zero for a computer is two. So with one bit of information, we have two possible states, on or off, uh, one or zero, black or white. So if we had an image where each pixel was represented by only one bit of information, we could have two possible states, two possible shades of gray, black or white. But if we added a second bit of information, we double the possibilities, don't we? If each pixel could be represented by two bits of information, well, we could have uh, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, one. 
we'd have four possible shades of gray. Would that make for a beautiful photograph? Probably not. You could have black, uh, dark gray, light gray, white, but you'd see some serious banding in there. Um, if we added three bits, add another bit, we double it again, two, four, eight. Eight shades of gray would be better. Still wouldn't be photo quality though, would it? Um, four bits, we could go to 16, 32, 64, 128. Ah, with eight bits of information, we have 256 shades of gray. All right, so that's where that 256 comes from. And in JPEG, that's what you're limited to. You're photographing in eight bits per channel. What do you have access to though if you're shooting in RAW? You can shoot in 16 bits. Well, your RAW file, you can process it to 16 bits. Your camera itself may only be 12 or 14 bits, but even if it's 12 bits, think about that. That's four extra bits of information. So you go from 256 to 512, 1024, 2048, 4096 shades of gray. And what's the advantage of those extra shades of gray? Well, remember that elastic string I was talking about, you know, a black bead down here at zero, a white bead up here at 255. And if you want to make a change to brightness, grab the middle bead, pull it one way or the other. Um, some of the beads are going to pop off the string. There just isn't room for them. And on this side, you're going to get some stretching out, some gaps between the beads. You're losing quality. And with only 256 beads, you're going to start to notice some degradation after a while. But if you're shooting in RAW and processing out to 16 bits per channel, you could have 4,096 shades of gray. If your camera has 14-bit capture, just over 16,000 shades of gray. And if you've got full 16-bit capture, which you know, you're pretty much limited to like you know, a, a phase one or a Hasselblad, you're looking at about 64,000 shades of gray. In practice, I think it's about 35,000, but you know, in mathematically, it's about 65,000 shades of gray, which would be pretty awesome. You can imagine like you know, 65,000 glass beads on that string. You grab the middle bead, pull it one way or the other. You might lose a few hundred beads or possibly a few thousand, but it's not as big of a deal because you still have thousands of shades of gray left. So that 8-bit is a little bit limiting with its only 256 shades of gray. Um, which brings us to the third advantage of the RAW format, the fact that you can change white balance after the fact. So if you were photographing indoors under those tungsten lights, instead of having to go into Photoshop, go to your yellow channel, grab that middle bead or that middle slider and pull it to, to play around, with, sorry, into your blue channel, grab that middle bead and heft it around, you can simply grab your color temperature slider and fix things up. White balance isn't a function of the raw data. The sensor sees what it sees, and it just writes that into the raw file. White balance is a function of how it's interpreted in your raw processing software. We talked about resizing images. Um, we talked about the aspect ratio, or the dumb aspect ratio, of your sensors. Uh, what's the aspect ratio of your sensors? Three to two. Uh, let's say you're doing a horizontal image. For every three inches of width, you have two inches of height, which goes back to the days of 35 millimeter film. Um, the negatives on 35 were one inch by 1.5 inches. Uh, one by one and a half, which is a one to 1.5 aspect ratio. We don't like fractions in aspect ratios, so we call it two to three. And it doesn't match up with basically anything except the four by six. So if I was making an eight by 10, Oh, God, I'm going to lose the top there. Okay, well, you know, I don't want to lose those, those windows up there, so I'll move up and, uh, oh, no, I'm losing the bottom of the dress. Um, it's a crappy aspect ratio that your cameras have. And there's not a whole lot you can do about that. So that's basically something that you need to take into account while you're photographing. Now, in terms of resizing an image, if I did want to resize this down to, say, an 8 by 10, I could go under image, image size, and I'll allow it to resample. Let's say I made it inches, made it eight inches wide. Oh, uh, I could go eight by 12. Uh, well, okay, well, I'll make it 10 inches high in it. Ah, oh, changes to 6.67. Let's talk about image size. If you use the image size command to resize an image, well, let me just hit okay here. Ooh, look at that, it got a lot smaller. There's before, there's after. Uh, with image size, it resizes the canvas. The canvas, think of it as that Thing that's open in Photoshop. Your image is sitting on the canvas. And when you use image size, it resizes the canvas. Oh, look, it made it way smaller. Um, and the image resized with it. What's the difference between image size and canvas size? Let's talk about this. If I used canvas size, let's say I did uh, canvas size and I made it, let's do pixels, let's make it a thousand pixels wide by, let's do 1,500 pixels high. That's still a two to three aspect ratio. Um, so if I hit OK, will it resize the image down to 1,000 by 1,500? If I hit OK, 
oh, it's giving me a warning here. The new canvas size is smaller than the current canvas size. Some clipping will occur. If I hit proceed, oh, the canvas got smaller. The image did not. So canvas size resizes the canvas, but leaves the image the size it was. So there's before and oh, there's after. If I use image size to make it 1,000, image, image size, we'll make it 1,000 pixels wide by 1,500 pixels high, hit OK. The canvas gets smaller. The image also gets smaller. Um, there's a little handout in there that kind of talks about it a little bit. Let's say this was the image that you were dealing with and you needed to make it larger. If you use canvas size to make it larger, the canvas will enlarge, but the image will stay the same size that it was. You can see she used to be this tall and now she's, oh look, the same height. If you use image size though, it'll resize the canvas just like it does with canvas size, but the image will also resize. So she used to be this large, now she's, oh, quite a bit larger. So with image size, the canvas resizes and the image stretches with it. With canvas size, only the canvas enlarges. And same thing if you're making it smaller. If we had to make a smaller version, if you use image size, the canvas will shrink and the image will shrink with it. She used to be this tall, now she's only this tall. If you use canvas size to make the canvas smaller, it will cut around the edges. It will crop it. You will lose information. So with canvas size, you make the canvas smaller, but the image stays the same size. So she used to be this tall. She's still that tall, but she's lost the top of her head, um, which makes survival unlikely. Now, if you make the canvas larger, you'll always get some kind of a little border. You can choose the border size. You can do black, white, gray. You can choose a specific color. But if you make it smaller, you will lose information. It will crop stuff. There's nothing you can do about that. What do you guys know about clipping masks or clipping groups? You can clip a layer to another layer. Um, we've used it for doing color changes. Like let's say I have a picture here and I want to make it uh, brighter or darker, but I don't want to affect the entire image. If I threw on, say, a, a curves adjustment layer and I played around with its contrast, oh no, it's going to affect all the layers below it. I only want it to affect this one layer. How can I do that? I could clip it to the layer below. And how can I clip it to the layer? Well, there's a bunch of ways. I could right click on the name here and I could choose Create Clipping Mask and look at what happens. Ooh, this jumped to the right a few pixels and this little arrow appeared pointing directly to the layer. So it's now only affecting that layer. There we go, it's only going to affect her. Um, there's other ways. If you hold down the Option key on the little line, notice that each of these layers has a little thin line between it. This layer and this layer has a thin line. If I hold the Option key and I hover over it, that little symbol appears and I can release or create a clipping mask. All right. But it's not just for adjustment layers. You can clip images to images. You can clip images to type. Uh, let's say you had the word ocean, and they had this beautiful photograph of the ocean. If you put the ocean photograph over the word ocean, the type, and clipped it to it, you would have the word ocean spelled out in a photograph of ocean. Um, or let's say you've got a, a portfolio, like a little um, a mailer that you're gonna send out to clients, and you're like, okay, I wanna put this in that kind of oval shape there. See how this little photograph is shaped like an oval? Is this photograph really shaped like an oval? Well, no, if I move it around, look, it has pointy corners. If I resize it, it's, hey, wait a minute. Why is it only showing up on this gray rectangle? Because it's clipped. If I unclip it, well, we see it for what it is. It's a photograph that's just kind of floating over top of a gray rectangle. But if I clip it to it, boink, it only shows up in the rectangle. So if you've got a little uh, flyer, maybe it's like you know that 35 millimeter film strip with the perforation holes and the little pictures of the 35 millimeter, you could take an image, drop it over, clip it, it'll assume whatever shape you have on there. So you don't have to go in, crop this image specifically, give it the rounded corners, um, in which case you're limited to that shape. With this, I can move it around, I can recompose. Same thing with this one here. If I were to put it over top of that gray rectangle and clip it to the rectangle, it now only shows up inside the rectangle. Plus, you'll notice that the rectangle had some layer styles applied to it. It had a bevel and emboss. You could put a drop shadow on it. The layer styles pass through to whatever is clipped to it. 
super awesome. And again, there's a bunch of ways you can make it. If you hold down the Option key, when you hover over this little line here, you can release or create the clipping mask. You can do it by right-clicking and choosing Release or create the clipping mask. You can do it from the pop-up over here, release or create the clipping mask. The keyboard shortcut is Option Command G, Option Command G for your clipping mask. Uh, you could go onto the layer menu. And anyway, there's, there's a bunch of ways of making clipping masks. So uh, I don't know why they gave you so many. Oh, we talked about the liquify filter. Yeah, let's just quickly run over that one again. Uh, the liquify, what does it do? Well, it can do horrible things or it can do wonderful things depending on what your intentions are. Filter, liquify. And if I grab this tool and I go has it done that to the image yet? Well, if I move this aside, no, it hasn't. What has it done? It's distorted something, a mesh that goes over top of the image. We're basically distorting the mesh with our liquify tools. Only when we hit OK, nothing done to it. If I hit OK, it does it to the final. Why does it use that mesh thing? Why doesn't it just do it directly to these pixels as I'm doing? Why, do, why couldn't I just call up Liquify, grab my forward warp, and go blah, and move her hair? Why do I have to go into that Liquify thing? Well, what happens when you move something a little bit? Remember, there's a canvas that the image is sitting on, and then there's the image itself that's sitting on that canvas. And if I were to, well, obviously, if we resized the image, we dragged it down. Uh, let's say I just took her and I did a Command-T, and I shrunk her down. That's obviously going to degrade the image, isn't it? If I then scaled it back up, OK, that would be bad. There we go. Uh, well, she's going to look a little bit blurrier, isn't she? So scaling would be bad. Even a rotation would be bad. If I rotated it just a couple of degrees, well, the image has a grid of pixels to it, and the canvas has the exact same grid of pixels to it. But if I rotate this image a little bit, suddenly it doesn't line up with that grid of pixels anymore. And when I hit return, it has to figure out how to redraw these pixels to show the same image, but in a new grid of pixels. And it'll soften ever so slightly. Um, the liquify tool is that to the extreme. If I do a liquify on this, blah, blah, and they're like, eh, maybe I put it too far. Maybe I'll push it back out. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know where I want that to end up. Somewhere around here. If it was moving those pixels and dropping them back into the grid of pixels on the canvas every time I did that, it would be softened into like non-existent blurriness. Um, by using the mesh, it distorts the mesh. Nothing is moved until I hit OK. Then it looks at the final position of the mesh, and it moves the pixels directly there, bypassing the whole in-between steps. So you just get one boom of softness added to the image. So it's, not gonna, it's, it's basically to minimize the amount of damage. So when you're using the Liquify tool, you are not moving pixels around in real time. You're doing it to a mesh, and when you hit OK, then it moves the pixels. We talked about dynamic range. We did that whole HDR assignment. What is dynamic range again? Well, it doesn't just relate to images, does it? We're, we, we think of it as the difference between the brightest and the darkest part of uh, whatever. Uh, if you're looking at a, a file in Photoshop, you got, well, in 8 bits, 0 to 255, and stuff can happen within there. That's the dynamic range of that file. Your camera has a certain dynamic range. Um, you know, the, how much shadow information and the difference between the shadows and the highlights, how much of that information can it capture? The scene you're photographing will have a dynamic range. What happens if the dynamic range of that scene is beyond the dynamic range of your camera? Like you're photographing that sunset, the sun's going down, and you got the beautiful colors in the sunset, and you have this, you know, there's a rock in the water, and there's some beautiful shadows, the pebbles in the rocks, but the shadows are gonna be really dark, aren't they? Is there any camera that can capture both detail in the sunset and detail in the rocks down there? No, the dynamic range of that scene is huge. It's bigger than the dynamic range of your camera, but it's just the, the maximum and minimum values uh, that can be recorded or that exist in a scene. Uh, in audio as well, if you've got um, you know, some speakers and a really powerful amplifier and you turn up the amplifier too loud, you'll hear this kind of distorting sound in the speakers because the signal is too strong. It exceeds the dynamic range of those speakers. And if you really overdo it, the speakers can actually catch fire. I was at a party where that happened and the speaker caught fire. It was possibly the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, so dynamic range is just the you know, dynamic values within a scene or whatever you're trying to capture. Um, if it goes beyond that, like say your camera can get this much and the scene is this much, um, you're going to get into, well, clipping shadows, clipping highlights, where things just, there's no more stuff happening. It's, it's static as opposed to dynamic. 
and we talked about blurs. We did a whole assignment on blurs, and you guys did all kinds of wonderful blurs. We looked at like motion blurs, and radial blurs, and tilt shift blurs, and field blurs, and iris blurs, and all kinds of cool stuff. So you might want to take a look at some of the different blurs that are available, so you can recognize blurs if you were to see them. 